Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our presentation on the Restaurant Revitalization Act. It's a recent uh, piece of legislation from, uh, from Congress as part of the American Recovery Plan. Uh, and joining us today to help explain, because there's a lot of misconception, I think, out there about the program. Um, joining us this morning are two members of the team from the upstate office, upstate New York office for the Small Business Administration or SBA. It's my pleasure to introduce them to you this morning. Uh, Howard Garrity is with us and, uh, and Jeff Boyce. And Jeff is over in, in the Albany office of SBA and uh, Howard is out of the Syracuse office and I'm thrilled that both of you can join us this morning uh, and, and provide some more information and explain what's happening. Um, Jeff, why don't we start with you? I know you have a presentation to kind of explain what this program is all about. Well, Ray, thank you. Uh, good morning. It's great to be back with you and your viewers and certainly pleased that you're giving us an opportunity uh, again today to help provide information uh, on what is our newest SBA disaster assistance program. Um, I'm just going to try to share my screen here and see if we can get this going. How does that look to you? That looks terrific. All right. So yeah, it's been a very busy year for us at the SBA. If you think back to where we started and some of the things we talked about before, you know, our disaster programs have been front and center. And we talked about the economic injury disaster loan program, the idle program, that's still uh, an option for uh, small businesses and nonprofits. We talked about the paycheck protection program or the PPP. That is in the process of winding down after a tremendously successful run. So uh, that program will close at the end of uh, this month. So just in a, a couple of weeks. But we're going to talk about today um, our very newest program, um, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. That and the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program are the two brand new SBA programs that, that we've just stood up here most recently. Uh, but again, today we're going to focus on the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. So uh, as Ray said, this was, uh, this was a new program that was created and funded as part of the American Rescue Plan which was the most recent sort of massive omnibus legislation to come from Congress. Uh, you can see there on the slide, the tremendous amount of funding. So this program uh, provides almost 29 billion in, in funds uh, for uh, us, SBA, to authorize. So we've created a brand new uh, program for folks to apply and to receive those funds. We'll talk about how that works, who's eligible and all that here this morning. Um, and as you can see, this program is um, uh, set to be uh, dispersed and then use those funds by March 11th of this year. So we started taking applications on May 3rd. It's only been a couple of weeks. So this is a very timely uh, discussion this morning. Um, you can apply now, uh, certainly. And we'll talk about the priority period for certain applicants. But I wanted to just give you a couple of statistics. So as of yesterday, our agency has already approved 21,000 applications through the RRF and has provided funding uh, of about $3 billion. So three of the 29, still a long ways to go. Uh, and those monies are hitting the accounts this week. And I hope there are some in New York State. Um, there are many, many more applications in the queue. I think something like 189,000 have come in, uh, but 21,000 have been funded already. Uh, and that's great news. So. Uh, I want to just kind of start with that. So, okay, uh, you've heard about this program. Uh, who's eligible? Well, the name says restaurant, and certainly that is first and foremost the type of organization or the type of entity that's eligible. But check out this list. Um, it's certainly a whole lot more. It's also uh, bakeries and brew pubs and distilleries and wineries, uh, bars and, and saloons and taverns. But even really small operations like uh, food trucks and food carts and food stands, um, and also things that maybe are a little bit um, atypical, things like inns that have a restaurant uh, component uh, to them. Um, and so really what's key is what you see here, the very last bullet, right? So it says here, or other similar places of business in which the public or patrons assemble for the primary purpose, primary purpose, of being served food or beverage. So 
if you're thinking of some type of an operation and you don't see it on the list here, that's a great way to kind of test and say, are they eligible? Well, that's if they can answer yes to that question, then then they likely they likely are. So in terms of the the types of entities, the business structure, uh, you see here it's a long list. So it's uh, different corporations, LLCs. Um, but I really want to draw your attention again to the fact that school proprietors and self-employed individuals, you know, some of the very smallest small businesses are eligible for this program. But uh, you must be struck with one of these entity types uh, to be able to apply. So a word about franchises, right? So what if you uh, own a McDonald's uh, and that's a franchise or some other restaurant? Are you eligible? Um, the answer is yes, as long as you are listed on the SBA franchise directory, which you know is pretty inclusive. Um, there is a process to be added to it if, if you're not for some reason, but you should double check and just be sure um, if you're applying and you are a franchisee, just be sure that the franchise is in our directory. Uh, and again, if you're not, you can be added. Um, another eligibility word about bankruptcy. So, uh, you know, what if there has been a bankruptcy or there is a bankruptcy situation that relates to the entity? It's been challenging times, no doubt, for the past 18 months. Um, would those folks be eligible? The answer is maybe. Uh, and this slide helps us kind of pick that apart. So, if the applicant is operating under an approved plan of reorganization, and that's a legal term that, that really is sort of derivative of the bankruptcy process, then yes, they are eligible, right? So they're in bankruptcy, but they're operating under that plan, okay. Um, however, you see down here below, you're not eligible if you're permanently closed or if you have only filed for bankruptcy. So if you're kind of early in the process and, and it hasn't really been worked out, there isn't an approved plan for reorganization, uh, then no. Um, so that's a way to test if, if bankruptcy is a situation that, that pertains to your business. Uh, and again, there is a pathway here forward uh, potentially for folks that uh, have suffered a bankruptcy. So as good as that is and as broad as that is for eligibility, certainly there are some folks who are not eligible. And so you see here different entity types. So certainly if you're a state or local government operated business, uh, not eligible. Uh, again, this is focusing on, on private sector uh, assistance. Similarly, if you're so big that, that you and, and your um, structure owns more than 20 locations, owns and operates, then again, this program is not for you. Um, also here, uh, you see the interplay with one of the other programs I mentioned, our Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program, SVOG. If you have applied or have received funding from that program, you're not eligible. Um, but that's okay because the good news is you, you have received or are getting monies through a different grant program that's probably more applicable to your business type. Uh, but just be aware of that. You cannot uh, receive funding from both. Similarly, if you're publicly traded, no, you, you, you have other resources at your disposal. Um, also, if you permanently closed, that's unfortunate, but Again, the intent of this program is to support ongoing operations and help them get through this. If you permanently shut down and you've got some wind down costs, this is not a program that can help with that. Um, similarly, if you're a nonprofit, this is not for you. Some of our programs have been broadened to include nonprofits, but not this. This is for for-profit entities. And finally, if you're so small that the amount of funding you qualify for would be less than $1,000, it's de minimis uh, and you would not uh, be able to, to submit an application. Okay, so who's eligible? Uh, great news, Jeff, how much can I get? Here you see uh, the answer to those questions, pretty significant amount of funding. You could potentially uh, receive up to $10 million if you had multiple locations, um, but you see here 5 million per location, um, that's huge. So, you know, we can help small, you know, food trucks and food carts, but we can help really big restaurants and some multi-location restaurants that have been tremendously, significantly um, adversely impacted um, with just a huge amount of funds. And again, these are grant funds. I know you know some of our other programs we talked about before, those are different. So idle is a loan that has to be repaid. 
Paycheck Protection Program was meant to be a forgivable loan that could convert uh, in some or uh, in part to a grant. This is a grant program. We're talking this morning about grant funding that is yours to keep and receive and spend in your business. And look, the intent in the simplest sense is to compare your pre-disaster operations. So you'll, be, you'll have to provide some information on uh, what your gross receipts were, your sort of top line revenues for 2019. You'll compare that to 2020 when the pandemic hit and you'll look at the difference and the whole intent of this program is to make up that difference, is to bring you back up to what uh, your gross revenues would have been if you had not been adversely impacted. That, that's it in a nutshell. And so if your restaurant was so big or you had multiple locations um, and, and if your operations were of a size that you realized millions of dollars in lost revenue, then again, you see here on the slide, this is a program that can help uh, make up for that funding. Um, just a quick word again about how this is different from others. So if you had been focusing on the shuttered venues program or some others, you know that for those, you had to do some things in advance. You had to register for this SAM.gov. You had to have a DUNS number, a CAGE number. None of that is required for this. Um, again, it's all you know, dependent upon how Congress uh, and their legislation sets the rules for the programs. They, they required us to do that for, for the other programs like SVOG, but for restaurant revitalization, that's not required. Um, so that's, that's important and that's helpful. Um, here's another important thing to think about. So how do the other SBA relief programs impact the amount of funding you might get? Basically, if you got PPP money, you have to net that out. So I talked a minute ago about how this is meant to make up the delta between your pre-disaster uh, and disaster year revenues, whatever that gap was, it's meant to bring you back up. But with this exception, you have to net out whatever PPP monies you got. Essentially, that's, you know, that's part of making you whole. And then for the restaurants and other entities, you would get the remaining difference. So that's an important distinction here. Uh, and again, you see the reference to the shuttered venues program. You cannot apply for this restaurant program and shuttered venues. Uh, that simply is not allowed. So here's an important attestation. You know, with most of our programs, there's an application, you provide information, and there's a lot of things you have to basically agree to, either by initialing or through your signature. And this is an important one. You have to, you have to attest to the fact that current economic uncertainty makes the funding request through this program necessary. That's a key word. So um, if for whatever reason, your operation has continued to do well, and maybe you have not seen a decrease in revenues or it's been pretty minor, um, then you would not be able to answer yes to this in good faith, um, and you would not be able to submit an application. So that's important. Um, okay, so if you get the monies, and again, it can be millions of dollars, how can you use them? Uh, it's pretty broad, but it's not everything, right? So here are the categories of eligible expenses that you can use the restaurant revitalization funds to pay. Um, so the biggest uh, category, or one of the most things in it, of course, is business expenses. And it's some of the stuff that you have seen from our other programs like PPP. You can use these monies for payroll, or rent, utilities, um, maintenance, supplies that you need for your business. Certainly since the focus is on serving food or beverage, your sort of wholesale food and beverage expenses to buy those raw materials, uh, those are eligible uses, uh, supplier costs and other operating expenses, which is fairly broad. Uh, and I'll say this, so as we always say, on our website, there's lots of good information about all these programs. But one of the things we've done, I think, a pretty good job of, especially with these two new programs, Shuttered Venues and Restaurant, is we've created user guides that go with all the forms and the other stuff. And, um, you know, they're fairly extensive. They're 30, 40 some pages, but they're written in plain English. They're pretty easy to understand. And they give you a lot of the details of the program, especially for stuff like this. So, when you're getting, once you get these monies or as you're applying, if you're wondering, well, what about this? What about that? Looking at that user guide is a great way to get further explanation of some of these eligible expense 
categories. So I just want to be sure to mention that. And that's on our website, sba.gov. Um, the next category, construction expenses, you see here it's really limited only to the construction of outdoor seating. And again, this is pursuant to the legislation. We didn't dream this stuff up. We're, we're administering a program based upon how Congress wrote the law. And so they do not want recipients to use these monies um, to do a big expansion, put out a new wing, pave the parking lot, open a new location. No, Congress said you can use it for these business expenses or you can construct outdoor seating, new or additional. And then finally, business debt, right? So they said you can also use it uh, to pay uh, mortgage obligations and debt service, um, but you cannot use it to prepay principal and interest. And so it can be used for business debt um, as well. The other thing I should mention is that you are spending these monies within a defined time period, the so-called covered period. And this is a term of art that we borrowed from the Paycheck Protection Program. And so the covered period is the time in which you must spend these monies, and it's very broad. So it starts, it actually looks back, and it starts on February 15th of 2020 and goes all the way to March 11th of 2023. So we in Congress have, have both you know, we've given you a broad amount of time to spend the monies, including that look back period. And it's for these eligible expenses that were paid or incurred during that time period. Uh, here you just see kind of a, a further explanation of that. Um, and then finally, if for whatever reason you did not spend all the monies by March 11th of 2023, then those funds would have to be given back to our agency. But hopefully you will. Um, you know, there's with every government program, there's some reporting. Uh, in this case, it's pretty minimal. But again, just, you know, to be uh, fully transparent, if you receive these funds, you will have to file an annual report and a final report. And in that, you're going to have to basically say how you use the money. So it's got to be in those eligible categories. Um, and I think that's reasonable, frankly, uh, to expect that. The details, and the form and format for these reports have not yet been uh, constructed or, or, or published. Uh, our focus was on standing up the program, so more to come on this. But again, full disclosure, you'll have to do an annual report and a final report if you receive these monies. Okay, so I talked about the sort of the maximum um, size of the grants, and there's different ways to calculate them. And, and there's, there's three different slides here, calculations one, two, and three. And I guess what I'd just say in a nutshell is that it depends upon sort of what your time period of operation is. And so calculation one is the simplest. And it's kind of what I said a minute ago. You take 2019 gross receipts. You know, what was I doing top line when things were normal? And then subtract away 2020 gross receipts. What was I able to eke out during this crazy year of the pandemic? Also, then minus net out um, any PPP monies. And then the balance of that mathematical equation is the amount of your RRF grant. And again, it's meant to then make that back up. So that's the calculation you see here. Um, and that's for, for applicants that were in operation on or prior to January 1st. So companies that are not relatively new and that have a full year of experience from 2019, and that's how they calculate their award. The other two calculations here basically are for folks that don't have a full 2019 year. Uh, you can take what you've got from 2019 and then do an average, that's what this one is. Uh, and then finally, calculation three, and it's kind of a hybrid where you can kind of take into account what you knew from, from 2020 and even into 2021, I'm kind of looking ahead. So um, that's really the key, but this program is not for brand new businesses. So if you're just launching your company now, God bless you, that's great. Uh, we hope you're very successful. We have other ways we can help you, but not through this program. This is for folks that have made it through uh, the disaster. And again, we wanna to try to make up that gap uh, and provide them with funding so they can continue you know, to, to be successful into the future. Um, so what are some things um, that you should exclude from your 2020 gross receipts? And first of all, why would you want to exclude things? Well, by excluding some things, 
your grant will be larger, basically. So remember, 2019 was, was the good year, 2020 was the less good year. And frankly, the less, less good it was, if that makes sense, then the larger the gap is and the larger your grant amount is. So here you see some things. Basically, if you've got other, other government assistance, you would net that out of your uh, gross receipts so that we would get a true snapshot uh, of your, your revenues without uh, the benefit of other sources of government assistance. So you take those out of your gross receipts costs. Okay, so hopefully by now, I mean, the reason you're part of this webinar is that you're very interested, you think you apply, hopefully now you, you know if, you, if you're eligible to apply. And here's how you'd actually go about that. There's three different ways. Um, first and foremost, uh, on our website. So again, this is a brand new program that we've stood up. We are the administrators of it. You apply, um, if you'd like, right directly to the SBA. And so you see, um, kind of a special web address that we've set up, restaurants.sba.gov. You can get to it from our main page as well, where all the disaster programs are very prominent on our website. And this is how many or most folks will apply. But kind of a neat twist here, as we built this program, um, we were able to identify an opportunity to partner with point of sale vendors. Um, these are companies that basically provide kind of like um, yeah, cash register type services, if you will, for small businesses. And we said to them, since you have great information on their gross receipts, you are their, their vendor for taking all of their payments from customers. Can we partner with you? And would you be able to be a point of intake for applications and marry your knowledge of their customers' gross sales with their other applicant information and port it directly to us? And they said, yes. Um, so, if you are an eligible applicant and you work with the following companies, uh, Square, Toast, Clover, and NCR Corporation, also known as Aloha. If one of those companies is your vendor for taking payments, you know, Square is that little thing that you scan your, your credit card through, a lot of small businesses use. If, if your business is eligible and works with one of those point of sale vendors, you can apply directly through them. Uh, go to their website. They set up a special feature where you provide your basic information and it takes you into the data they have about you. It gets linked together and ported directly to the SBA. It saves you having to enter a lot of your gross receipts data. It basically is the benefit. So that's option number two. Finally, um, you can call. Uh, I do not recommend this. Because if you call, they'll talk to somebody, they will mail you paper-based applications that have to be completed, signed, notarized, and mailed back. Um, it is an option. It's kind of like the last worst case scenario. So I really encourage you to use uh, options one and two uh, to apply for the program. So Jeff, what am I going to need to apply? Here you see uh, the information. So of course, there's a form, SBA form 3172. That is the application for the RRF. You'll need to complete uh, this next form, uh, IRS Form 4506T. That basically authorizes the IRS, the tax department, to share your tax records with the SBA so we can verify who you are and what your uh, revenues were for 2019. That's important. And then uh, the gross receipts documentation. And I guess the good news is it's a long list. There's a lot of different things that we will accept. Um, those tax documents certainly are the gold standard, but um, there's many of different many different things you can provide as part of the application. And I should probably kind of pause here and just say, if you're thinking of applying for this program, you meet the eligibility, all this sounds good, you're ready to apply, don't just log onto our website cold and think it's going to be five minutes and you're going to walk through it, right? Take a look at these the, this list of documents and recognize that you will want to prepare all this stuff first, maybe have you know, digital access to it saved somewhere on your computer or whatever, so that when you actually log on to our website, then it is a pretty quick process. You've got all your information together. Um, that's really good advice that we give to folks. Uh, if you need help, you can always call myself or Howard. Um, even better, call our resource partners. 
Um, that's SDDC SCORE, the Women's Business Centers and Veterans Business Outreach Centers. We've talked about those before. They can give you even more personalized and direct support to gather these documents, but do that in advance before you go to the website and to actually apply. Um, finally, just a reminder that you're going to need your tax ID. So uh, if you're a business and that's your, your EIN, your employer identification number, if you're a sole proprietor, independent contractor, that's your social security number. Um, you can also use an ITIN, an ITIN. Um, if you're a resident alien and you don't have a, a, a social security or EIN number, as long as that ITIN number um, is valid and good, and they're good for three years. So uh, just make sure that, that the number you have is, is good to go. Um, here's just some more information, again, depending upon the different calculation methods uh, in terms of what you're going to need. And I'll just tell you, there is a sample application on our website. You can take a look at that. Uh, here's more information for calculation three. Um, finally, a word about some of these specific business types, right? So yes, it's for restaurants, but it's for other stuff. We saw that in the beginning. So if you are one of these, if you're a bakery, a distillery, a winery, a tap room, a tasting room, a brew pub, or if you're an inn, there's kind of an extra step. And so what we're saying is we recognize that you may have other business functions beyond just you know, serving you know, the public food or beverage. So that's okay, but for these business types, there's kind of an extra step. And you see here in bold for both of these, you have to provide documentation evidence that your on-site sales to the public comprise at least 33% of your gross receipts for 2019. So if you're a brew pub, it's okay if you've got a canning line and you're selling cans to go. Um, if you're an inn, it's okay that you know, you're an inn and you're providing lodging, but you've also got a restaurant as part of that. You just have to prove that at least a third of your gross receipts are coming from that food and beverage sales directly on site. If you're a bakery, maybe you're selling stuff in wholesale to grocery stores or uh, someplace else, that's okay as long as a third of your gross revenues are sales that you're actually making on site to the public. So that's what that's about. Okay, um, I mentioned that, you know, certainly Howard and I can provide help, our resource partners can provide help. There's also a special call center that we've stood up just for this program. You see the number there. Um, they're open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So uh, folks are busy during the day. You can call in the evening. That's fine. Um, they also have the ability to provide information in 10 different languages, right, which I think is really helpful. Because again, we want to direct this aid to everyone who's eligible. We don't want a time of day or languages to be a barrier to folks getting the information you know, that they need to submit a successful application. So here are some best practices. And the first one we talked about, you know, really get your information together in advance. Um, be sure that your documentation is complete. Um, that's really, really important. You know, put your best foot forward, uh, do it once, and do it you know, really in a sound and compelling way. Um, leverage your resources. So, Talk to your accountant, talk to your CPA, your bookkeeper, the smartest people you know, get all your tax documents uh, together um, and try as best you can to avoid corrections. That's a very difficult thing to do in this process. So you really wanna get the information um, correct the first time. And finally, if you have a PPP application, get that in first and get that processed so that you know the amount of that funding and you can net it out uh, from, your, from your application. Um, it's taking about 14 days to process applications, and certainly if you do all of these things, uh, the hope is that your application uh, would be processed uh, and acted upon within that two-week time period. That's, that's an expectation that we're shooting for. So uh, when can you apply? Right now, right? So we opened applications back on, on May 3rd, uh, but you see here that for the first 21 days, the first three weeks, uh, we're mandated by Congress to have what they call a priority application period. And we can take applications from, from everyone, but we can only process and fund applications from the priority groups that you see listed here. And so those are businesses owned by women, veterans, 
um, and, and socially and eco economically disadvantaged groups, um, things like minorities or others. Um, so those folks get processed and funded first during the first 21 days. And then after that, starting on May 24th, we can process applications from all eligible applicants. So there's no reason to wait, get yours in, uh, but just recognize that if you are not one of the priority groups, yours would not be processed until May 24th. Uh, here's just some more information on those priority groups. And again, they have to be at least 51% owned and controlled uh, by these different entity types. Um, and it's a self-certification process. So you basically self-certify that you are one of these eligible entities. But I'll just caution you, everything about you know, government programs um, is sort of publicly knowable. And I suspect at some point, you know, there'll be lists of you know, what businesses got money. Um, and certainly, if they identified themselves as one of these uh, eligible entities, you want to be sure that you're, you're being honest and accurate um, if you think you are one of these priority groups. Here is just uh, some more definition from the law uh, of, of how these different entity types are defined. Um, and again, all this is on our website. So if you're not quite sure, you can read up on this. Uh, and see if you qualify, see if you are one of these priority entities. And then finally, here's an important thing. So don't try to be clever, right? So anyone who tries to basically reorganize their business to change the amount of ownership or control so that some member who might be one of those priority groups suddenly is in charge, uh, no, don't try that. That's grounds for automatic disqualification. You know, put your efforts into getting all your documentation together carefully submitting the application perfectly the first time. Um, put your efforts there, not in any kind of creative restructuring of your business. Um, there are some funding set-asides. Uh, again, we're trying to direct uh, funding where it's needed most, which is the smallest of small businesses and those that have been hit hardest. So again, of that 29 billion I talked about before, 5 billion is set aside uh, for businesses that have uh, gross receipts of less than 500,000. Uh, there's another tranche, 4 billion for kind of the next level up, uh, 500 to 1.5 million. Um, and then finally, there's 500 million set aside for applicants that had gross receipts of less than $50,000. So the very smallest of small businesses um, also have a little a, a bucket of funding just for them. And so this is something else we do as the applications are coming in and as we're able to process them, we make a match. And if we get something that's very small and tiny, we'll fund it from one of these buckets that's set aside for those smallest firms uh, so that we be sure that monies are directed uh, to those, uh, those types of entities. Um, and so there's kind of a you know, whirlwind tour uh, of the program. I hope that I gave you a good sense of who's eligible, how to apply, what you're gonna need to apply, who can help, uh, how long it's going to take to process it, who gets processed first. Um, that should give you kind of a good overview, kind of a good sound foundation in the program. And then if this is right for you, we'll do a few things. Like I said, go to our website, read some of the more details, look at the sample application, read the user guide, um, talk to those smart people that you know, uh, including our resource partners and, and SBA staff, gather all your documents, um, and then hopefully once and final, do your application in a way that's accurate and complete um, and get that funding because that's our goal. Now, this is a national program. The funds are going to go all across the country. Um, but what Howard and I and the folks here in the upstate district hope is that we can, uh, by partnering with, with Ray and others, first of all, spread the word and generate the broadest interest, but importantly, prepare the most folks in our district to apply and to receive that funding. That's our goal. I hope that's your goal, is to bring as much of these monies as we can here to our district and to small businesses in the Southern Tier, all across upstate that so desperately need these monies to continue on into the future as we, as we recover uh, so that you can recover strong and be successful. Terrific. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much. That's, that's tremendous. Great information. We do have some questions and just a note to uh, those who are on the, the call with us today. If you have some questions, please post them in the, in the chat area. Um, one question that we, that we received um, 
actually is from my full purposes of full disclosure here. Uh, we have a question from my son, Dan, uh, who has a uh, wall about hospitality uh, is his company works with restaurants and cideries and wineries and other ho hospitality businesses uh, in New York and up and down the Hudson Valley. Uh, he has a question uh, for wineries and other beverage manufacturers who qualify with the 33% of sales on premises, do their, does their, um, do their sales decrease include on premise sales or is it inclusive of total sales, including wholesale sales? So if they're, if they're on premise declined by 33%, um, you know, do you factor in the, the wholesale or does that have to be 33 as well? No, so it's both, right? So you've got to have at least 33% of, of, your, of your gross revenues be on-site sale of food or beverage to the public. But that's like an eligibility threshold issue. But then stepping back, when you're calculating the amount of the grant, it's those top line numbers. So if you took a big hit, both in your on-site sales and your wholesale sales, that's reflected in your top line numbers. And it's that delta in those top line numbers, 2020, 2019, 2020, that you're looking at. And the whole goal is that the RRF funds close that gap and bring you back up. So if, if uh, like a lot of our, uh, just our beverage producers here in this area uh, really went into those uh, wholesale uh, market um, in, a, in a greater way, if, if their overall bottom line, like you said, their top dollar has to show that 33%. Um, and, and an additional question, um, for, for new wineries and breweries, um, do their expenses as calculated in calculation three include expenses used in the manufacturing of their products, including materials, equipment, and so forth? Well, so again, to calculate the amount of the award, you're not looking at expenses, you're looking at gross revenues. But then once you get the monies, you can spend it on those different categories that I mentioned. And certainly some of the categories relate to um, operating expenses that you have for the business, um, having to buy sort of the inputs of your process. So does that help? That's really the distinction that I see. Well, it's for, for businesses that may have opened in 2020. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so for that calculation, if you do, if you do not have, you know, a full, a full sort of experience in 2019, you're taking whatever you had in 2020 and trying to extrapolate on and make it a, uh, an annual number uh, by multiplying by 12. So yeah, you, you would look at it that way. Okay. Um, another question, um, are theaters and cinemas who have a gross sales are whose gross sales include 33% plus from concession sales like popcorn, soda, candy, et cetera, are they eligible uh, for this program? Maybe, right? So, you know, if they're not specifically listed, then you've got to use that last bullet on my slide, which is that test of, you know, you know is, is substantially, you know, I think the exact words. Um, Let's go back and actually look at it here. So, here it is. Uh, so, if your business type, in this case a theater or something else, is not specifically listed in the enumerator, then the question is um, is it a similar place of business in which the public or patrons assemble for the primary purpose of being served food or drink? So, I would say that going to a theater that also has a restaurant and concession stand, the primary purpose you go there is probably not to be served food or drink. I think it's more ancillary, but that's okay because I think for those types of businesses, our other program, the show uh -huh. the opportunity to be better fit. That's okay. So there is sometimes some overlap between these two programs. The challenge is to find the one that is the best fit for your business type. And in that example, I think shuttered venue is the best fit. 
The uh, just a couple questions that that I have um, as well. Just uh, I, your presentation was terrific, and I know you're going to be sending those um, to us, um, and and I'll be sharing those slides with 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 everyone. Um, well, let me let me get let me just go some before I get to those. Um, Dan added a little bit more. Um, additionally, for wineries and craft beverage, if they opened their on-premise facility in 2020 or 2019, but the business has been incorporated and making wholesales, wholesale sales prior to that, would they qualify? It's a great question. It is a great question. I, be I believe from that example, they would qualify, but in some of these kind of specific situations, to be honest, we've got to kind of look at the exact numbers, go back and look at the, you know, exactly what the program will say and come up with the most precise answer that beyond sort of threshold eligibility helps them do the calculation in a precise and accurate way. And this is where um, you know, the, the accountant, the CPA, the bookkeeper, and an SBDC counselor, a score counselor, they can sit down with the applicant or over video chat and look at the, you know, the PL statement or the tax returns and look at perhaps in, like in this example, how the business operations changed over time and actually hone in on precisely how those calculations can be done. So a lot of this becomes what we call situationally specific. Um, and so that's why I recommend in a case like that is you really want to get with those partners, hone in on the numbers, and do your calculation in the most precise way. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned that right now the um, the registration period is is open, and those applications that are being processed um, are fall are those that fall into into certain groups. And you mentioned. Um, the socially and economically disadvantaged. Does one become um, economically disadvantaged based on geography? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, so there is some language that talks about those two groups, right? And so here it says economically disadvantaged individuals are those socially disadvantaged individuals, so you've got to be sort of number one first, whose ability to compete in the free enterprise system has been impaired due to diminished capital and credit opportunities as compared to others in the same business area who are not socially uh, disadvantaged. So you've got to think about that, right? This is how Congress has written the law. Right. Yeah. So apply if, uh, you know, we have areas here in Delaware County that are considered economically disadvantaged. Um, some towns are fall into that category. Other town, townships do not. Uh, so if there's a question, probably apply and, and let folks at SBA figure out if that ap application gets processed at this point. That's exactly right. So, you know, certainly, even if you are not a priority group member, you know, this is not owned by women, minorities, socially, you can apply now, and you should uh, just recognize that we are not able to process and then fund your application uh, for a couple more weeks, but you can apply now and get into the queue. And that's, that's good advice that we give folks. Um, the hope is that there will be sufficient funding uh, to satisfy you know, both those initial applications in the first 21 days and beyond. And if there's not, that's unfortunate, but what we hope is that we could show then sort of the, the pipeline, the, the uh, number of remaining applications that we've received, and that might be um, helpful for Congress to think then if they want to allocate additional funding. And there's been some press that suggests that they might. We cannot predict that. Uh, sure. That's our message is don't wait, even if you're not in a priority group. Apply now. We'll process it when we can. And even if we run out of funding for now, we can point to that 
And as we, you know, if we think about PPP, there were multiple rounds of funding. Then they change it, let us do a second draw. So there's some precedent for Congress recognizing where there's unmet need and providing additional funding. Uh, Jeff, if I could just make a comment, Ray. Oh, sure, Howard. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, listening to uh, Jeff's presentation, um, I don't think I could really add anything to it, you know, just to echo what Jeff has mentioned uh, probably two or three times already. Um, take advantage of the RRF program guide dated uh, April 28th, 21. Uh, you know, it really drills down on those areas uh, already covered by Jeff. But just to comment on the priority group definitions, in addition to uh, slide 28, uh, if you look at the application itself, I believe it's item 14. There's a very, very, very lengthy uh, paragraph on those definitions. Okay. Um, so that, that's all I will add. Great. Yeah. And, and for those who are on the call uh, or who register for this later on, I will link that publication uh, in, in that confirmation email and I'll send it to, to those who are on the call. Um, guys, just, we have a, a few minutes, just a couple questions that I have, unless, um, those who are on the call have other questions. Um, can sole proprietors with no employees apply for this program? Great. It's a great, great question. And the answer is yes. All right. So again, while we can provide millions of dollars in this program, there is no requirement that you have some big staff, that you have a headcount, a number of employees, none. Um, simply that your business meets the eligibility criteria. So yes, sole proprietors, independent contractors, self-employed individuals who are eligible you know, based upon business type and structure, yes, they can apply. Now you, you... You, you discussed this at some length, but just for purposes of clarity, um, what counts as eligible expenses? You know, I see it says supplier costs. Does that include the purchase of restaurant equipment that's used to make those, those to prepare those meals? Yeah, that's a great question. We get that a lot because look, if you're in the food and beverage industry, some of your greatest expenses beyond staff, frankly, uh, would be equipment. You need, you know, if you're brewing or distilling or if you're cooking or baking, you're investing a lot of money in, in, in a lot of expensive equipment. So we get that. Um, I would say this, um, the focus here under business expenses, which is the slide I put back up, is on maintenance and supplies and operating expenses. So, if you have to maintain a piece of equipment, if you have to have it cleaned or serviced, um, if some part of it you know, breaks, certainly those would seem to me to be you know, really strong examples of eligible uses. Conversely, if you wanted to buy more or different, or if the whole thing broke and you wanted to replace it, I do not think that meets um, the spirit of this because it talks about expenses that you incur as part of the ordinary and necessary operations of the business, sort of day-to-day -day costs versus more of a capital cost. Um, if you've got a bakery, you know the oven may be the most expensive thing you have. That's that's your means of production. That's more of a capital cost. Uh, okay. So that's how I think about it. Okay. Yeah, just to jump in one more time and, and, and jump back to the, um, the RRF program guide, if you take a look at uh, page 10, it covers the eligible uh, use of funds. So just Wonderful. Great tool, right? Let's, let's talk about a business that's a corporation and the restaurant has other businesses. Let's say it's, it's part of a, uh, there's a restaurant and there's a hotel. Uh, or whatever it may be. And, and you receive the first round of, of PPP and you got a second round of PPP funding for all those businesses, uh, the different companies under that corporation. Can you subtract only the PPP monies um, that were allocated to the restaurant from the 2019 minus the 2020 restaurant gross receipts? 
Yes, and that's another great question because oftentimes, the, you know, it's kind of a conglomerate, right? There might be a like yeah. holding company and, and different subsidiaries and, you know, some are eligible, some are not. They got different PPPs. It can be confusing. So, I, so yes, generally, the answer is yes to your question, but I would step back and say, first of all, the way you engage with this program and, and, and how you apply in terms of the name and the tax number has to be consistent with how you engage with PPP. So if you applied kind of at the holding company level, because that's where the EIN is, and you've got different subsidiaries, do the same here. But when you're getting to the part about, you know, counting the gross receipts and netting out PPPs, then you only take into account those numbers from the entities that are eligible for the restaurant revitalization fund. Conversely, if, if the tax identification numbers are down at that sub-entity level, you know, you've got a real estate holding company, but you've got a separate restaurant and something else, and they've all got their own tax numbers, then you may have to do multiple applications at that lower entity level, DINs, and hopefully that's the same way you engage with PPP. They have to mesh, um, but that's, that's how you think about it. You can do either, uh, but the focus is always on uh, PPP funds received and gross receipts for only for the eligible entities as it relates to the restaurant revitalization fund. Jeff, thank you. Um, Jeff Boyce with and Howard Garrity, both with the Upstate Office, uh, Upstate New York Office for the Small Business Administration. Thank you both for your time this morning explaining this really important program. Um, and we'll be uh, posting this to the Chamber's YouTube channel. We'll have it uh, broadcast through Delhi Telephone. And of course, we'll make this as a on-demand uh, presentation uh, workshop uh, at DelawareCounty.org. Thank you, everyone, for thank you, everyone, for for joining us this morning, especially to Jeff and Howard. You know, this is all a partnership, and I'm thrilled to that we have friends at at the Small Business Administration. Um, so DelawareCounty.org is where you can find us. Find out all this information. Jeff, Howard, thanks again. I have a feeling that this is not the last time that we're going to be talking about uh, maybe this program and some others. I agree. Ray, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we're here to help. So don't be shy. Uh, we're, we're glad to come back and talk some more. Yeah. Excellent. You're a great partner. Thank you all. Bye, folks. Bye, guys. Bye.